uh, th he should have gone ahead with the joke. Uh, uh, the reason I'm the toughest sheriff in America is because Joe Arpaio is number two. <laughs> and I had, I had to have that uh, argument with him. Uh, he actually called me when we were both sheriffs. He called me and he said, you wrote a book. And I said, yeah. And I, he says, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Ask your boss. And uh, he goes, I don't have a boss. And I said, that's right. You know? So uh, I said, well, technically we both have a boss, but there's bunches of them. It's the voters. And I said, that's the only way I really want it. And uh, he... He at first campaigned that uh, the sheriff should be appointed, but after he was elected, he saw how stupid that was and he changed. Uh, you want to keep your sheriffs and you want to keep them elected. They answer to you. And when Joe asked me about uh, him writing this book, he said, well, uh, you know, I'm writing a book. And I said, what's the title? And he said, uh, uh, the toughest sheriff in America. And I said, well, I'll have to sue you. And he goes, why would you do that? And I said, because you're number two and I'm the toughest. And he goes, well, how do you figure that? And I said, look, Joe, it's really elementary. You took on the street gangs, the prostitutes, and the drug dealers. I took on the Clintons. <laughs> so, um, but my question to start off this whole thing is uh, why would I do that? Why would a small town sheriff, my county was 35,000 people, Joe Arpaio's is 5 million. Why would a small town sheriff in southern Arizona sue his own government? Take on the Clinton administration no less. And I am really happy at least I'm one of the few that took on the Clintons that actually is able to live to tell about it, you know? And uh, so, but, but why do that? Why, why get involved with such a David and Goliath situation? Um, and I, I want to tell you uh, the history behind what brought me to that point. Uh, my, my chosen profession was to be in law enforcement. I wanted to be a cop. Uh, I, I actually wanted to be an FBI agent. My father retired from the FBI in 1974. I went back to college in 76 to, to get a degree. Uh, I'd already graduated from a, a community college in, in, in Arizona where I live. And so I only need two years and I'm gonna, I can get in the FBI. And so that's what I wanted to do. That never worked out, but while I was working my way through college, I got a part-time job as a meter maid. And uh, the official title, you know what the official title of a meter maid is? Parking Enforcement Cadet. I, I don't know, I kind of like meter maid better. But um, so anyway, uh, I really got to like the uh, police department. This was in Provo, Utah. Uh, and I, both my wife and I are from Arizona. But I was working my way through college there and I decided to hire on in 1979 full time after I graduated uh, with the Provo Police Department. And I had a horrible, terrible, traumatic experience there. I was actually asked to go undercover. And uh, this was before I was converted and that I knew anything better about the drug war. And I was just basically a soldier and you know, they asked me to go undercover, I go undercover. Uh, changed my name, beard, long hair, big afro. Uh, I'd already been on patrol for two and a half years before this, so I had to change my appearance as best I could. This was a horrible experience for both my wife and me. And uh, my wife basically became a single mother. We had three little children at the time, and we couldn't be seen in public at all. Couldn't go to church together, couldn't go anywhere in public. I, I, we had a date once to Salt Lake City, and another time we had a date uh, we went down to Las Vegas, which is only about five and a half hours uh, drive, in, drive time from Provo. So uh, other than that, we, uh, I had to sneak, sneak home to be able to see my kids l at night and uh, then sneak back the next night to my apartment. And, and uh, it really started, this assignment really started me questioning what we do in law enforcement as, as a matter of routine. Uh, e even because of this, I started questioning roadblocks, administrative checkpoints, 
that law enforcement in America thinks it's appropriate and just fine, no problem, if we stop everybody, check your papers, and have to do that before we allow you to go on down the road. Does that strike you just a little bit from another country in Europe? It did me. How can we do that here with, with complete impunity and, and not recognize the historical significance of why that is wrong? And so then I started questioning, of course, I started questioning the drug war. And I don't question it anymore. It's an absolute farce. And it, it, it just plain and simply is more big brother government. And, uh, you know, I saw back here on the, the newspaper, that journal newspaper, it said there's 1,286 cities in America where the drug cartels of Mexico are now operating. In the United States, 1,300 cities. Uh, do you want to know how to put them out of business? Legalize marijuana. You want to, you want to put them out of business? They're, it's irrefutable. Okay, let's do the scenario, Okay. Somebody comes up to you and tries to sell you marijuana. And you go, well, how much? Uh, let's say, and you say, uh, <laughs> okay, how much? Uh, and you go, uh, the guy goes, uh, 150 bucks for an OZ. And uh, you go, I can grow my own for five bucks. Does that tell you the scenario? You're out of business. There's no more pushers. I can grow my own, you stupid. Don't try to push this on me. Okay? It's just that simple. And there's only one, been one time that I've ever used marijuana in my entire life. I was a cop. I was undercover. First time and only time that I've ever smoked it. And you had to. It was a dime a dozen. They passed around the bars. What am I? I'm going to be sitting there telling them I want to buy it. And when they come to... Passing around, I go, oh, no, I don't use it. No, you know. <laughs> it's going to make you look a little bit suspicious. Yeah, there goes your cover. So I had to smoke it. And I really don't think it's any big deal, but it, at the same time, I, I hope people don't use drugs. I pray to God that people will stop using drugs, especially the ones from the doctors. That is a huge problem, you know. But, uh, but be that as it may, I think that if we really lived in a free country, we would be making those choices for ourselves. And, and speaking of making choices for ourselves, uh, it's on my website, so I'll just tell you. I never wrote a ticket for somebody not wearing a seatbelt. And I told my deputies not to either. And, and I'm sorry. Uh, and so what are you thinking right there? So other officers are going to go, Oh, Sheriff Mack doesn't believe in people using their seatbelts. Yes, I do. I use mine all the time. Didn't I use mine all the way here, Ken? Yeah. Yes, I did. So anyway, I use my seatbelt. But it's not the police's job to make that choice for you or to force you to use, oh, he's not wearing a seatbelt. Let's stop. And, and look at the incrementalism, the Fabianism that was behind the seatbelt laws. At first, it was just a suggestion. And then it was a little bit of an infraction where they couldn't stop you for not doing it, but if they saw you not doing it, they could give you a little $10 fine if they stopped you for something else. Now they do roadblocks, and there are $110 fines in, in some places for not wearing your seatbelt. Because why? Because we have to have government protecting us from our own stupidity because they're smarter than we are, and they're making our choices for us. And aren't we just so grateful for them protecting us the way they do? You know, I'm sorry, but freedom is more important than writing tickets. And freedom is more important than anything else that we can do in government. We leave people alone. We actually define freedom by how much government leaves us alone. And, and good or bad or indifferent, I'll make my own choices and you leave me alone unless I'm hurting someone else. Actually, you know, a novel idea that I might create a victim or even a potential one. 
Otherwise, leave me alone. So the, you know, and, and I'll tell you in my books, uh, and I don't have this particular book with me today, it's called The Proper Role of Law Enforcement. I actually have a term for ticket writing, and it's called taxation through citation. Because that's exactly what it is. Now, my other books are out there. Uh, these, uh, this is a copy of the Supreme Court decision that we're going to be going over uh, on, on the wall today with my presentation. Uh, this, this is one of the most powerful tools you can hand to anyone. Have you ever argued with anybody about the lack of federal authority? Just hand them this. In 10 minutes, they'll learn more about state sovereignty than they have in their entire lives. Or all their teachers put together, no. <laughs> okay? And then uh, my first book that I wrote, uh, From My Cold Dead Fingers, that's out there. And I'm going to go uh, read something out of this in just a minute. But also, the, the next best tool I have is uh, The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. And this connects the dots as to why uh, all peace officers, not just sheriffs, but sheriffs in particular, because, you know, he's the only elected law enforcement officer in the country. And he answers directly to the people. But I, I beg all police officers, all peace officers, all law enforcement officers, all sheriffs, to do one thing in here. Keep your oath. Keep your word. You promised to be a constitutional guard. That's what should be on every police car. You see all those cars? I think Hawaii, if you've ever been to Honolulu, their cars has uh, pride, integrity, fairness, or something like that. And, yeah, it is pretty funny, too. And, um, uh, and then a lot of them say protect and serve on their vehicles, stuff like that. Actually, every, every uh, police car should read Constitutional Guard. Because that's, that's what we promised to be. Now, one other thing. We just did a fundraiser out in California uh, last Wednesday, and I had these pictures uh, developed. Because I took a picture with, uh, in fact, uh, G. Gordon Liddy and I spoke together uh, about... 10 years ago, maybe more. Let's see, this is 11. This is about 13 years ago. And he and I were in Vegas. And so uh, there's three of these out on the table. Well, there's two in this one. Three out on the table. And those are $25 each if you want to get one. I'll sign it. And then you can hope that you run into G. Gordon Liddy sometime and you get him to sign it. So, yeah, and you can tell him I did that. So, anyway, he'll remember it. He has a great memory. He has a fantastic mind. So, so, uh, you, did he get what? No, he, he didn't forget. He said, I'm not going to tell you. That's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, go ahead and put me in prison. He's, and so they did. Yeah. Oh, no, he didn't forget. Uh, that's one guy you want to sit down and have an hour talk with and say, whatever I ask you, you have to tell me the truth. And, and it, uh, uh, an interesting side note with this, as soon as I got out of the Uni United States Supreme Court, I had two of my children with me, and they were both in high school. He sent a cab for me to go right on his show. Okay, so Lucy and my son Rich went with me. And so they're in the lobby, and G. Gordon Liddy and I are talking about the Supreme Court case. And he goes, Sheriff, who'd you bring with you today? And I said, oh, that's my daughter Lucy and my son Rich. And I said, after the show, Lucy needs to ask you some questions that her government class developed for you because they're studying Watergate. And you know what he did? He said, bring her on right now. So this is my 15-year-old daughter interviewing G. Gordon Liddy about Watergate on national radio. And believe me, that's one day she never forgot. <laughs> but he was very gracious with her and, uh, you know, actually inviting her to come on a show to, to ask some very poignant, deep, penetrating questions to him morally about how he could be involved in the Watergate the, the way he was. So anyway, but uh, he served six years in prison and became a national celebrity and uh, does a, a great radio show still today. Uh, and, and I would consider him a friend. I think he would tell you the same thing. But, uh, you know, there's some things I totally disagree with what he has done in the past. So why did I sue the federal government? Well. Right after I finished my undercover assignment, I was assigned back to patrol for a little bit. And then after that, I got some other assignments in community outreach and school resource officer and some other things, developing programs uh, to get the community involved in getting rid of drugs. Uh, so I'm out 
600 west, 300 south, and I'm writing tickets. And why am I writing tickets? Because that's what cops do. We write tickets. And my department was extremely numbers-oriented, and they wanted numbers, 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 numbers. And, and, and so I, I didn't want to play second string when it came to writing tickets. I was hoping that I would set records writing tickets. I'm serious. You know, I, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm at a four-way stop, and I'm the only living thing within 150, maybe 300 feet of this intersection. And I'm just south of the intersection facing north, and I'm as close to the stop sign as you can legally get, and I'm in a marked unit. I'm not in an undercover car at all. I'm in a marked unit. And this lady runs a stop sign right in front of me. Little did I know that she's about to change my life forever. And I get up to the car, and, and she already has her license and registration out the window, you know. And as I looked in her car, she passed by me, you know, or came about two-thirds into the intersection. She realized what she had done. She threw up her arms when she saw me as if to say, Ugh, what else could go wrong today? And I looked inside her car, and maybe some of you ladies that have had two or three or 15 kids could relate to this because it looked like the Tasmanian devil going on. And all it was was a bunch of kids, hers. And they were acting up so much that she was so preoccupied with trying to settle them down. She lost track of where she was on the road, ran the stop sign, sees me, pulls over. And she never says a word to me. This lady is going to change my life and never says one word. She gave me her license and registration, so I start writing the ticket. I'm, I'm all happy because she's not crying. I don't have to worry about fighting with her and just arguing and say, no, lady, you ran the stop sign, that's it. Don't give me nothing. You know, I don't want to fight with her. I'm writing the ticket. And it's more than obvious that this lady couldn't have afforded this ticket if it was $5. Her car isn't worth 300 bucks. It's an old Datsun compact station wagon. Dotson, yeah, I said Dotson. Primer gray showing through, and uh, her kids were very poorly dressed, very unkempt. She was also, and she's getting a ticket. Poor people get in accidents too, right, officer? Yeah, too bad, she's getting a ticket. And then right at the end uh, of the ticket, an officer signs his name and his serial number, which I did, and then I paused, and I looked down at this dejected, depressed woman, and I looked down at her snotty-nosed kids, and I looked down at her cruddy old car, and then I looked at me. And this was the most penetrating gaze I'd ever felt in my life. And I said, Mac, is there anything you're doing here that's helping this family? Is there anything you're doing here that's honorable, that's making this a better place to live? And now, I'm more depressed than she is. <laughs> and I just walk away. I hand her her license and registration, and I don't give her a chance to thank me because I don't want to be thanked for what I had become. Unfeeling, incompassionate, forgetting humanity, being a by-the-numbers jerk. And so... Uh, I went back to the police station. I tore the ticket up, which was a violation of policy because it was already filled out. But anyway, I did. And um, I wondered why I was a cop the rest of the night. And I decided that I had to start over. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew I had to start over. That my job depended on it. If I was going to continue this job, I had to start over. How, after three and a half years in law enforcement, you've already worked undercover, you've already worked about every major case there is, how do you start all over? I didn't know. All I know is I was looking for something. And the next day I came back to work, and this was swing shift, and it's, uh, swing shift patrol started at 3. Briefing was at 2.30. I came in about 2.15, and I'm walking around the police station, and all I know is I'm looking for something. What am I looking for? I don't know. I have to find it though. And then I, work, and then I kept uh, walking and I went over to the uh, city center side and I ended up walking into the uh, city clerk's office. And she said, Officer Mack, can I help you? And I said, 
To this day, I do not know why I asked this because it was never a topic of conversation. I said, when I took this job, did I take an oath of office? And she goes, well, yeah, you did. You, you signed it. And before I could ask, she handed it to me. She burned me a copy, handed it to me. And now I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I'm going to go quit my job. Because I, Richard I. Mack, solemnly swore or affirmed that I would faithfully uphold, defend, and obey the United States Constitution and the Constitution of Utah. And I'd never read either one of them. And I'm going to tell every peace officer in this country and every sheriff and every other government employee that takes that oath, keeping that oath is impossible if you've never read the Constitution. Okay? So, so I'm actually taking off my badge. I'm leaving. I feel horrible. I took an oath to get a job and to get a paycheck and to drive cars as fast as I wanted. You know? And that was it. So I'm quitting. I realized what I had become, and I'm quitting. I was a liar and a hypocrite. I had no intention of keeping that oath. I didn't even remember taking it. It was a little ceremony after the police academy. That's all it was. And so uh, I'm actually uh, crossing over from the, into the lobby from the city side to the police side, and... I'm going into the chief's office and I'm going to turn in my badge and gun. I'm not giving two weeks notice. I'm leaving right then. I'm not staying. I'm done. And I imagined, because I'm married, I imagined having this conversation with my wife just before I get into the police side. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so she goes, um, well, let me see if I got this straight, Mac. You quit your job today because you're a liar and a hypocrite. I said, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just saying I'm sorry. The whole time. She, you know, she's got me wherever, you know. And she goes, you couldn't consider uh, keeping your job and quit being a liar and a hypocrite? <laughs> well, <laughs> I said, thank goodness for good wives, and I certainly had one. And, but, do you see, but do you ladies see how smart you are? You win the argument, and you're not even there. Yeah. And so I guess it's why you have a wife, she's your conscience, or at least your subconscious. And so I put my badge back on, I went downstairs, went to briefing, and then I went home. And there's the pretty little blonde girl. She goes, what are you doing home? And I said, I'm getting the World Book Encyclopedia. And she goes, to go on shift? I said, yeah, the one that says U.S. Constitution. You see, nobody had given me, uh, nobody had given me one of those back then. And this was about 1983. Because I worked undercover in 82, so I know, I know it has to be about then. And uh, you're packing, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, good, all right. All right, well, we'll throw that at them when they start shooting. And so, so um, she goes, well, what are you doing that for? And I said, well, I'm going to read the Constitution. So any time I wasn't on call, I had the big old huge con uh, World Book Encyclopedia, and I was reading it, especially the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence too, but that came a little later. But it was easy to understand. I was surprised that it was easy to understand, that it really wasn't that difficult. And I read it several times over, and then, I, like I say, I got into the Declaration of Independence, started reading about the Founding Fathers, and I was loving all of it. And then another miracle. Part of this epiphany, I had another miracle happen. On the bulletin board in the training room came an announcement that uh, the state of Utah, Post, do they call it Wisconsin Post? Most of them do. Post, Peace Officer Standards and Training, the bureaucracy for the state that oversees qualifications for cops, is announcing a training seminar entitled Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers. And I said, man, that's exactly what I need. I'm going. And at the bottom of the page, it gave the, the name of the instructor, Dr. W. Cleon Skousen. And so he used to work in the FBI with my father. And uh, so I said, man, I'm going to this. And while I was there, a two-day training seminar conducted at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, I was converted. 
it happened. And I took another oath, and I was the only one that heard it. I said, I will never be on the wrong side again. And so I continued on from there, and uh, I kind of got a reputation as a constitutional cop because I would always bring the Constitution and think, well, is this okay? Is, is that constitutional if, that, if we do that? Well, the Supreme Court said we could. I said, but does that mean it's constitutional? I mean, the Supreme Court has made a lot of mistakes over the years, you know? And so, and do they run our department or do we, you know? And so if we know something's wrong, do we just go, oh, well, the Supreme Court said we could, so we are, you know? And do, the, do we have to do everything the Supreme Court says? You know, and that was another question we asked. You know, just because they make it, they say it's constitutional, does that mean we have to do it? An obligation? Do we have an obligation to do roadblocks? No, we don't have to do that, even though they said it was okay. So, uh, but nevertheless, because of my, even though uh, my, my reputation notwithstanding, I started uh, getting promoted, and rather quickly. And things are going great in our lives, and, but, time out there, you know what happens when things are going great in your life. The in-laws call. <laughs> and my wife's parents are calling me and lobbying me to move home to Arizona and run for Graham County Sheriff. And I told them, there's no way I'm going to do that. That's crazy. I've got 11 years on now. Uh, I just was patrol sergeant, and now I'm a sergeant detective. And I'm loving my job, and the kids are all doing well in school. And there's no way we're going to do this. And, and so I, I told my wife, I said, your, your parents are crazy. And she goes, yeah, I agree with you. And this is the first time in our married lives that she ever agreed with me that her parents were crazy. And so I must know I'm in the right this time. And so every time they called, I would just hand my wife the phone. I said, you talk to him. I'm not going to talk to him. So she would tell him, leave him alone. We're not moving home. Forget it. And um, so then they had other people calling and lobbying us. And... Um, so finally, I told my wife, I said, look, let's just put an end to this. And I said, let's list all the pros and cons as to why we can't do this. And there was 23 cons. 23. So I thought any reasonable, even half reasonable person, not her parents, are going to understand this. And there's only two pros, and that was just to be back home, closer to her parents and mine. And we sent that down to them. And... Three or four weeks later, we moved home and ran for sheriff. <laughs> True story. Uh, to this day, I still look back and say, why in the world did I decide to do that? I don't know what happened, but we did. We packed up, moved to Arizona, went home, and you, you need to realize I hadn't even lived there for almost 12 years, had never been a cop in Arizona, let alone in my hometown. And I walk in and say, Make me your head law enforcement officer. Make me your sheriff. And they did. In 1992, I was reelected. And in 1993, somebody in Washington, D.C. started lying. And I know this is really going to hurt your feelings and shock you, but it was Bill Clinton. <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, I, saw, I watched the ceremony. I don't know why I watched this, because I really wasn't interested, but I guess it just caught my eye. Uh, and it was on national television. He's using 13 pens to sign the Brady Bill into law. And I, don't, I still don't remember the symbolism behind the 13 pens. But I really wasn't paying that much attention. But I remember that part. And I also remembered what he said because I was thoroughly entertained by it. Just like Washington, D.C. is all the time. It's a big joke. And so he said, the Brady Bill is going to make the streets of America so safe that even our cops won't need to carry guns anymore. Drum roll, ting, you know. Yeah, um, because I thought, he's saying that with a straight face. That's even better than, I feel your pain, you know. <laughs> and uh, so uh, then on January 21st, three months later, uh, well, two and a half months later, uh, we're having a meeting of the sheriffs in Arizona. There's only 15 counties in Arizona. And 12 sheriffs are at this meeting. But there's three strangers in the room, and it's three agents of the BATF, federal agents, in our sheriff's meeting. And they handed us each a document. It takes three of them to hand 12 out. And they handed us each a document, and they said, Sheriff, this document details your marching orders as to what you have to do to comply with the Brady Bill background checks. 
that we have to conduct criminal background checks on everyone in our county uh, just for wanting to buy a handgun. And so they want to go into a gun store, exercise their Second Amendment rights. Nope. Can't do it. They have to fill all of this paperwork, send it all over to me, and then we use our personnel, our time, efforts, money, budget, whatever, to do this for, for the federal government for free. No negotiation, no contract, uh, no participation uh, at all from us in making the decisions as to how this should happen. And to top all this off, true story, people think I make this up. I'm going to show you the evidence as we go along here. There's a threat of arrest if we fail to comply. The first time in U.S. history that an unfunded mandate forcing local officials to participate carries with it no money. Usually they, they just say, hey, we'll give you the money if you come along, buddy. Not this time. A threat of arrest if we fail to comply. When these guys left, you never heard so much cussing in your life. Not even the liberal Democrat sheriffs were supporting this. Nobody liked it. After I heard all these guys rant and rave, I was the youngest sheriff in the state. They're ranting and raving and cussing about this and the federal arrogance. They can't tell us what to do. And then six hours later, they're all going, well, nothing we can do about it. You can't fight City Hall. I heard that over and over from the sheriffs. And I said, you guys, wh what are you doing? You already totally convinced me that I couldn't do this. And now you're telling me we might as well go ahead. I said, sorry, I made up my decision when you were cussing. Remember all that, you know? You, you, you guys totally convinced me. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, but I can't go along with this. And they're all just staring at me. I thought I would get like, yeah, let's go with Mac. Yeah, let's get a few amens, you know. And nothing, nothing. Just, I think, maybe somebody said, don't forget, you can't fight City Hall, you know. Who wants you to believe that? City Hall does, you bet. Especially the one in Washington, D.C. So I had three-hour drive to get home from the, the meeting in Phoenix, and I'm just brooding about this Brady Bill thing, brooding and brooding. About halfway home, I'm in Globe, Arizona, and I make two decisions. One, I am not going to comply. Two, I am not going to quit my job over this. I didn't think my wife would let me anyway, okay? I didn't want to have another one of those conversations that I didn't really have with her, so, so no way. But now I'm at a conflict, so I'm still brooding the other hour and a half home about what am I going to do with that conflict? What if they try to arrest me? And so about two blocks from my house, it hits me. I'm going to sue my own government. I'm going to sue the Clinton administration. Believe me, I'm not all excited. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I get to sue the Clintons, you know. And the scariest thing of all this, I got to go in and tell the pretty little blonde girl. <laughs> what am I going to tell her this time? And so I am just sweating this and sweating this. And, and I haven't been home for a day and a half. And she comes up to give me a hug. And I just blurt it out. I'm going to sue the federal government. I'm going to sue the Clinton administration. They're going to squash me like a little pumpkin seed. And I hope you don't mind. <laughs> and of course, you know what her reaction is. She's just going, what are you? What? And I go, I'm going to sue the Clinton administration. I'm going to sue the federal government on the Brady Bill. They're forcing me into something I can't participate in. And it's going to cost us everything. Home, career, job, moving, whatever. And I really thought that. I thought they were going to just squash me and, you know, not kill me or anything like that. I really didn't think that. I just thought they were going to marginalize me and make me look so stupid that it would, and I would embarrass myself so much over this that I would just leave, you know, move to Cuba or something. And uh, where, where, you know, there's more freedom. <laughs> no, no. So uh, I told her that, and she goes, well, I was always kind of wondering why you were elected sheriff. Maybe this is it. And I'm just going. And, and she goes, and besides, we weren't really looking for a job when we landed this one. I said, I'm going to take that as a yes. And she just kind of shrugs. You see, ladies, this is where the decision was made. She made the decision. If she had said anything negative, 
I would have gone, oh, good. I can't do it. I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. You know, like, we have five children. Are you thinking about them? What, what's the matter with you? Are you going through a midlife crisis? What, do you want to be Don Quixote or something? The windmills are real. These are federal windmills. They fight back. Okay? Oh, no. No, she said nothing of the sort. And the next day I go to work. Anybody, all you constitutional scholars, I've heard all this constitution stuff today. Anybody want to advise me what I do now? Yeah, that's what I thought you'd say. I have absolutely no idea what to do. I thought real briefly that I could call a lawyer buddy of mine down on Main Street in Safford. Let's sue the federal government, okay? You know what he's going to say. What the sheriff said can't fight City Hall, and are you nuts, Mac? And uh, I'm not a member of anything. I have no national organization behind me. I have nothing. But my undersheriff walks in. I remembered he was a member of the NRA. I said, hey, does the NRA have a number where you could call and get advice? <laughs> so I called this number he gave me on his card. And I got put on hold a bunch and passed around a bunch. And finally, I landed in the office of Richard Gardner. I remember this conversation like it was yesterday. And I told him who I was, what I wanted to do, and he said, Sheriff, we've already been preparing the paperwork on this case, and we've been praying that you would call. And I just am dumbfounded, floored, so excited. I said, well, we're going to, now I'm all excited. I'm, oh, good, good. We're going to sue on the Second Amendment. We're going to prove to everybody that it's a God-given individual right to keep and bear arms. And he goes, calm down, Sheriff. We're not even suing on the Second Amendment. He says, we have no standing on the Second Amendment. You have no standing on the Second Amendment. And I said, so what paperwork have you prepared? You're the NRA. He says, we're suing on the Tenth Amendment. We have an airtight case. The federal government cannot tell you what to do or anybody else in your state. And I said, even better. <laughs> so on, uh, the, there's one other caveat I gave him. I said, look, I said, I really appreciate all your support and willingness to pay for this lawsuit. God only knows it's going to cost probably a half a million dollars or something. He says, no problem. And I said, well, look, I want my own lawyer. I don't want this to be the NRA case. It has to be my case. He said, no problem. We'll work with your lawyer. And I said, can you suggest somebody out in Arizona <laughs> that might know the Second Amendment, the Constitution? He says, yeah, Dave Hardy in Tucson. He used to work for us. He's a great guy, a great constitutional lawyer. So I called Hardy, hired him. And uh, on February 28, 1994, the very day the Brady Bill took effect, my lawyer with the NRA lawyers filed in federal district court in Tucson, Arizona in the courtroom of one Judge John M. Roll. The judge that was murdered on January 8th of this year in the Tucson shooting. This was probably the best judge in America. And on page 18 of my first book, I have uh, page 19, I have his ruling. And do you want to see what kind of man he was? Let me read that to you real quick. The court finds that in acting 18 U.S.C. 922 as to the Brady Bill, Congress exceeded its authority under Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, thereby impermissibly encroaching upon the powers retained by the states pursuant to the Tenth Amendment. He also gave us the Fifth Amendment. And why did he give us the Fifth? He's the only judge to do it. Of all the judges that heard this case, he's the only one to give us the Fifth because he was livid about that threat of arrest, and it violated my rights to due process. Okay? And so the Supreme Court did not give us that, nor did any of the other circuit courts. Six other, six other sheriffs joined this lawsuit after this. Sheriff Prince was second from Montana. And he and I were consolidated because we're in the same circuit court, which is the Ninth Circuit. And you know we did. Yeah, you better laugh. Because nothing good ever comes out of that place. Uh, and we lost. We got overturned. But Sheriff Coog from Texas and Sheriff Romero from Louisiana won big time. 
at the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. Now we have conflicting rulings on the same case. And my lawyer said that's going to guarantee us a trip to the Supreme Court. And indeed, Sheriff Prince and I went to the United States Supreme Court on December 4th, 1996. And on June 27, 1997, the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Brady Bill was indeed unconstitutional. Not the background check. The mandate to us was the only thing stricken. The, ma the background check's still there. But another thing most people don't know is there were actually five Brady Bills scheduled for your gun control enjoyment. Yeah. And this lawsuit ki completely killed two, three, four, and five. Moynihan, Senator Moynihan from New York, actually uh, proposed uh, Brady Bill 2, and it was blocked in committee because of our lawsuit. And they said, let's see what Brady Bill 1 does first before we start doing more. And they were all killed. And uh, believe me, <laughs> uh, it would have wiped out gun shows. FFLs mostly would have been done. Ammunition would have been restricted as much as guns are, more so. It was crazy. But anyway, what I want you to know is my motivation for a lot of this was definitely the Second Amendment. But technically, just as I said, we could only go on the 10th. And this ended up surprising me so much, reading this case, that we actually did a case on the 10th Amendment that restored state sovereignty and actually a judge talking about state autonomy and, and state sovereignty and even... Uh, the oath of office, and we're going to show you all that now. And it, it, can this, can these lights go off? Uh, if we can get that row taken care of, we're probably going to be all right. As an investigator, I always want to show the evidence to the jury, and so you're the jury, and I want you to see the evidence. I don't want you to just to hear a story from a, some crazy sheriff from Arizona, um, former sheriff from Arizona, and uh, I want you to see the evidence of this case. And remember, everything you're going to see. Uh, is in this little booklet. And I don't know quite how I squeeze so much into one little 16-page booklet, but um, it is in there. And you can, you can show this to anybody. County commissioners really need to see this. City councilmen, sheriffs, peace officers, state reps, governors, that this really puts us in a position of not going along with the federal government, but also being assigned to put the stop sign up to the federal government. Uh, who is it that you think is going to enforce state sovereignty? Who is it that you think is going to enforce the 10th Amendment? Oh, I know, you guys are waiting for Barack Obama to pick the state sovereignty czar. I don't think he's going to pick a state sovereignty czar. I just kind of have that feeling, you know? I've only heard the oath of office talked about basically in 20 years I spent in law enforcement in two places. One was my Supreme Court case because Judge Roll talked about it in his first decision and this movie, Clear and Present Danger. It's, it's simply an item that is not talked about. You know, when we talk about, when we're in briefing uh, and, and they're talking about the new constitutional decision made by the Supreme Court, they never talk about 
how it actually affects our oath of office. No, the Miranda decision or any of the others, the, the Carroll Doctrine or Terry versus Ohio or any of these other case law studies, only that this is what it allows us to do. Not does it put us in a predicament or a quandary of choosing between right and wrong or one or the other. And uh, so I was amazed by this because the only thing important about our job is do we keep our word? Do we keep this solemn oath? Or do we perjure ourselves when we take this oath because we have no intention of keeping it or following it? We're just going to follow orders. We're going to do what our sergeants and our chiefs and our lieutenants tell us to do. And is that how we comply? Is that how we fulfill our oath? We give it to somebody else? As long as my sergeant's telling me to do something constitutional, then my oath is protected. What if he tells me to do something I'm not supposed to do? What if he tells me to do something that is clearly unconstitutional? Well, I don't know. I've never read it. So we're going to go back to the basics here for a little bit. There's the oath. And, and it's different in every state. And the military oath is even more different. The military oath will say, protect the Constitution from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. I believe that we here in, in, the, in public service in the state still have the same obligation. That we have to protect the Constitution from all enemies, both foreign and domestic. Even though ours doesn't say specifically that, it's still our obligation. Uh, but the thing that I find most remarkable, no matter what oath you're taking, military, whatever, from the dog catcher all the way down to the president, we all, oh. I'm, sure, I'm sure there's some order in there that fits. But anyway, we all take the same oath, and the Constitution is always first. The U.S. Constitution. And I still maintain, you can't keep that oath without reading it and knowing and understanding the intent. We always talk about criminal intent in law enforcement. Well, what was the intent of those who wrote it? And that's easy to find out. And on the Second Amendment, it would take a second grade student five minutes to find out the intent of the Founding Fathers. That was one place there was no argument amongst the Founding Fathers. The Second Amendment was easy for them because they knew how it related to freedom. Oh, my question? Why do we take the oath? What requires us to take an oath of allegiance to the Constitution? Six. There it is. Article 6, last paragraph. The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state. So we have the state legislative branch and all executive and judicial officers. So we have all three branches of government, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. So all three branches of government have the same what? Assignment and goal and purpose, and that is to uphold, defend, protect, and preserve the United States Constitution. It is a check and balance system the Founding Fathers put in the supreme law of the land. So if you don't take an oath before you take your job, you have violated the supreme law of the land. And if you don't keep your oath, you have violated the trust of the people. Now, State nullification, we hear that all the time. There's a book out on the table by Tom Woods about state nullification. It's in this newspaper that's going around your tables here. State nullification, is that something that I made up? <laughs> yeah, I only wish. Thomas Jefferson talked about it in the Kentucky Resolution of 1798. And look what he said there in yellow. The states have the authority to judge the constitutionality of the federal government's laws and decrees. So you mean the federal government or the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have all constitutional authority to say what is freedom and what is not freedom? Well, how about the states? Why would they be responsible for uh, judging the federal government's actions, whether they're not constitutional or not? Because we formed them in the first place. Who formed the federal government? The states. And then every state comes into the union 
on equal footing. Just as equal and powerful as the original 13. Then why is it that Arizona is 85% owned by the federal government and New Hampshire is only 2%? That doesn't sound like equal footing to me. Nevada's 87%. Utah's 75%. And it keeps going like that in the West horribly. And we're going to talk about it, but let's keep looking at state nullification. Jefferson argued that the state should refuse to enforce laws that they deemed to be unconstitutional. And Madison is right with him on this, except Madison takes it to the next level. And look at the word he uses. Interpose. Look at that. That the state's legislature is duty-bound to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. They actually knew back then. These guys knew what government is. They knew what power is. They knew what politicians were. They've seen this before. They've seen democracies fall and come and go. They knew what happened in Rome. They knew what happened in Greece. They know what, that power corrupts absolutely. And, and this was just a design to prevent all of this. And the first time in world history that the people would govern the government. And that's what our Constitution was designed to do. And in doing so, it was to keep a very limited and impotent central government. The whole purpose of the Constitution was to make sure that our own federal government could not repeat the abuses of King George III. That's the whole purpose of it all. Now, just so you know, when we go through this case, we're going to go through the case now pretty quick. Jay Prince, the sheriff from, from Montana, and myself from Arizona, were the two litigants in this case. And here's Judge Roll again. Do you see what a great guy this was? Mac is thus forced to choose between keeping his oath or obeying the act, subjecting himself to possible sanctions. I told you, he was really obsessed about that threat of arrest. And there he's talking about it again. But he grasped in one sentence my entire motivation for doing this lawsuit. I had to choose between keeping my oath or obeying the law. And I'm telling every cop in this country, when your legislature or your sheriff or your chief or your sergeant put you in the same quandary, I think our choice is simple. We keep our word. And to keep our word, we have to know the Constitution or we're lost. And so is America. And does anybody think that we're really in trouble today in our country? I mean, we're talking about all this huge, humongous debt that you were just talking about. Do you really think we're in trouble because we're following the Constitution too strictly? Far from it. He's right. In the future, full quarter will be given to British wounded and any who surrender. British men of war gave no such quarter when he fired on a ship carrying my wife and daughters. I <coughs> said, <coughs> my orders did. Down your sympathy. We're militia. This is not regular army. Every man here is free to come and go as he pleases. But while you're here, you will obey my command, or I will have you shot. So, you mean when we have to go to a movie about the, the, the American Revolution to find out what the militia really is? Don't we know what the militia is? <laughs> he just said it. We're not regular army. And yet my eighth grade son in his government class about 15 years ago was told by his government teacher that the Second Amendment guaranteed the right of soldiers and the National Guard to keep and bear arms. That was one time we had to have a teacher-parent conference. <laughs> because... How did that go? Well, let's just say she was almost crying. But uh, it was the part that I said, why do you get to rewrite history for my son? That really kind of got to her. But... Uh, you see, the National Guard wasn't formed until 1903. And can any of you, all you constitutional scholars, I'm still looking for it. 
Any time where one of the founding fathers said or expressed his concern as to whether or not soldiers could keep and bear arms. In fact, if you read the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, they didn't even want a standing army. So uh, I doubt very seriously if a standing army was not supposed to be there any longer than two years, as the Constitution says, that they were really concerned about these guys keeping and bearing arms. You'll never see it. It doesn't exist. And there we go, rewriting history so that they can promote what? Gun control. And uh, this book is all about that very issue. And it shows the international leaders throughout history who have used gun control and what it has been used for. And uh, I don't want any of that in America. But yet we have 25,000 gun control laws now. So when Congress and the federal government violate the Constitution, and when the whole Constitution and the Bill of Rights particularly starts with, Congress shall make no law. And if they do make a law against religion or against freedom of speech or the right to peaceably assemble or the freedom of the press, who is going to stop it? Them? It's called state sovereignty, my dear friends. It's our job. It's the state's. It's your sheriff. It's your county commission. It's your governor. It's your state rep. It's everyone in your state involved in anything. It's our job to stop it. It's a check and balance. The Tenth Amendment is just as important as the three separate branches to diminish and keep government impotent. And I'm going to show you all this. Okay, I'm not, I'm going to, again, I don't want you to think you're just getting my opinion here because you're not. Quite frankly, my opinion or yours about the Constitution really doesn't matter. The opinion that matters is the one of the guys who wrote it. There's the threat of arrest. I told you I didn't make it up. Under a separate provision of the Gun Control Act, that, this modified the Gun Control Act of 1968, the Federal Gun Control Act, any person who knowingly violates the section of the GCA amended by the Brady Bill shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for no more than one year, or both. This is in the Brady Bill. This is the threat of arrest. We actually got an injunction against them. Judge Roll siding with me again against his own boss. And we got an injunction against the Clinton administration from being able to arrest me. Because at this point, I'm the only sheriff in the country. I'm all alone. And my lawyer said, you might want to get an injunction against these guys. And I said, do you really think we could get it? And he goes, well, let's try. Roll gave it to us. And Janet Reno wrote a memo to quash the, the injunction. And she said... The threat of arrest in the Brady Bill doesn't really apply to the sheriffs or, or the Cleos, as they call us, just the gun shop owners, she said. And Judge Roll said in his ruling that gave us the injunction, said, Janet Reno is not allowed to interpret the law for Congress by fiat. We got it. If you don't give me that seat, I'm going to have you arrested. If you don't get to the back of the bus, I'm going to have you arrested. 
If you don't stop selling that raw milk, I'm going to have you arrested. <laughs> What's the difference? Not a damn bit. I still cannot wrap my mind around this incident. This happened in America with the endorsement of the United States Supreme Court. What was the decision? Separate but equal. Mm -hmm. You're still equal, but your equality has to sit in the back. And you can go ahead and sit in the front. Is, does that make you feel equal? But the Supreme Court said so. So it must be constitutional. It must be right. Every major incident that has happened in this country where people lost their lives and freedom from stupid laws and stupid politicians and stupid enforcement officers, every one of them could have been prevented by somebody keeping their oath. Somebody with a badge, somebody in uniform should have stopped what happened here. Somebody should have made sure that Rosa Parks went home and was protected and that her husband had a shotgun ready just in case any trouble happened. And somebody in a, with a badge and in uniform should have stopped what happened at Kent State University in 1970. Somebody with a badge and a uniform should have stopped what happened at Ruby Ridge, Idaho in 1992. Somebody should have stopped what happened in Waco in 1993 that had a badge and took an oath to the Constitution. And somebody should be doing that today. And a constitutional sheriff and a constitutional officer would have got on this bus and would have sat down next to Rosa Parks and would have shaken her hand and would have said, Mrs. Parks, I have to tell you, what you did here today was really courageous, and I really admire you. And would you do me the honor of allowing me to escort you home to make sure you get there safely? Because there could be trouble in the town. She could have been lynched. Troublemakers like this got lynched in America. And then he and his deputy take her home, and they tell her husband, Make sure your shotgun's loaded and ready because we can't be here every second, but my deputy's going to be giving you extra patrol all night long and throughout the days to come. But you let your conscience be your guide in how you protect your family. And you see, that's a constitutional sheriff. And he does the same thing for the farmer today wanting to deal with raw milk or cheese or the rancher or the homeschooler or Rosa Parks, the gun owner. Or Rosa Parks, heaven forbid, the tax protester. Because I tell you, i got to side with Ron Paul on this one. In fact, I haven't seen anything that Ron Paul has said that I don't agree with. <laughs> you know? But uh, he actually said, and I had a V8 moment, and I, I kind of went, no kidding. Because he said, abolish the IRS, yeah, and abolish the federal income tax, yeah. But this was the kicker. Replace them with nothing. Yes. And, and I said, I asked the same thing that some of you are going to ask. Well, how would our government survive if we're not paying our income tax? And you say, they'll be forced to quit all that corrupt spending, and they'll have to follow the Constitution. That means no more lobbyists. That means no more pet projects. That means no more pork. That means no more entering stupid wars. Or kinetic actions. Uh, you know? The bottom line is the enforcement of stupid laws are the essence of tyranny. And where do we stop ty tyranny? Everywhere. And where do we stand for freedom? In our counties and our cities and our school boards, but right here in our own neighborhoods. I don't know if this is going to be a big shocker to you, but you can forget getting freedom back in Washington, D.C. In fact, my opinion about the, the economy is, and I think you pretty much said this, it's irreversible at this point. Even if Ron Paul got in there, I don't think he could stop what's going to happen now. We've gone too far. We're the past the point of no return. It's too far gone. 
when you're 15 trillion dollars in debt and your whole country's entire wealth is 20 trillion when actually the promises are up to 90 trillion there there's no way I, I'm you know I'm I'm not I'm not an economist but I'm telling you look at what's going on I mean Canada's dollar is has been for what about a year more valuable than the American dollar when did that ever happen before yeah no it's scary yeah okay Ronald Reagan this disappoints me in Ronald Reagan that he actually said this because it shows that he understands the problem but he didn't do anything about it but this is nevertheless a very true statement our federal tax system in other words the IRS is in short utterly impossible utterly unjust and completely counterproductive it reeks with injustice and I have to ask your constitutional guards in your county again who is it that's assigned to protect your citizens from injustice sheriffs officers deputies county commissioners state legislature yeah we got a lot of work to do don't we This is a direct quote from my case. We have held, however, that state legislatures are not subject to federal direction. Don't you wish they knew that? This is the U.S. Supreme Court, folks. It's in here. Would you like to pass that to a few people? Can you think of some right now? Like your county commissioners, your state rep, and this gets much broader, much deeper, and much more powerful as we go along. And I'd say we get, this whole thing, this whole thing is about a two-hour class, but I do a four-hour class for law enforcement. And because the first hour and a half is just the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And then we get into this and back it up with this decision. It is incontestable that the Constitution established... Now, there's a couple of problems with Scalia, and I don't want to be so arrogant to, to pretend to anybody that I'm smarter than Scalia. But uh, he makes just a couple of minor mistakes here. Anybody see him? First of all, he said, is it is incontestable that the Constitution established a system of dual sovereignty. He's talking about the federal government being sovereign while at the same time the states are sovereign. It's, it's hard to argue that you can have two sovereigns at the same time, but I'll agree with this. You know why? Because the federal government's sovereignty is so small and infinitesimal, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't change this. It doesn't change the sovereignty of the states. And he reemphasizes this, but this is a big mistake where he says, although the states surrendered many of their powers, the states didn't surrender anything. What does the Tenth Amendment say? Delegated. Delegate and surrender are two different things, huge differences. So he's wrong about this. He's wrong about surrender. We did not surrender anything. And even if we did, it wasn't many. But he corrects that. But at the same time, read the last line. The states retained a residuary and inviolable sovereignty. If the state of Wisconsin was inviolably sovereign, do you think we'd be able to run our own farms? Do you think we'd be able to run our own geography, our own highways, our own forests, our own water, our own air? Oh, no. You can't do that. The federal government's going to do all that for you because you guys are too stupid. And you see, and I know we're really stupid in Arizona, but I still think we could run the Grand Canyon without the federal government. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm just going out on a limb there, but I think I'm all right. Okay, then he follows it up. Now, Scalia corrects himself a little bit. Residual state sovereignty was also implicit, of course, in the Constitution's conferral upon Congress of not all governmental powers. Don't you wish they knew that? But only discrete enumerated ones. Where do we see those? Article 1, Section 8, okay? Which implication was rendered expressed by the Tenth Amendment's assertion that the powers not delegated to the, the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In essence, the Founding Fathers are telling all of us in government for all generations 
that just in case you think we forgot something, you can't do that either. And that's the Tenth Amendment. Because everything they don't say in the Constitution, like, does it say the Constitution, does it say you have the right to be a father or mother? No, it doesn't say that. But you do, don't you? Well, of course. And so all those other powers are still yours. Okay, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment make this very clear. And the Tenth makes it very clear that states are the ultimate power. And we're going to keep going to see what Scalia does next. The great innovation of this design was that our citizens would have two political capacities. One state, one federal. Get the next line. That's the real kicker. Each protected from incursion by the other. So if the federal government comes into Wisconsin and commits any kind of an incursion, who is responsible to stop it? States. We are. Wisconsin. And how about the political subdivisions of the state? Cities and counties. Can they play along? Oh, no. No, just the state. No, <laughs> that doesn't make sense either. But I'm going to, just so you know, that political subdivision term comes from Scalia in this case. Yes, we are part of it. And there he goes. As Madison, he, he's actually quoting the founding fathers in the Federalist Papers. Can you imagine? The local or municipal. Who are the local or municipal authorities? Counties and cities. Of course, right here. Form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. Obama's suing Arizona right now on the supremacy clause. And yet, this case actually, he actually talks about the supremacy clause. You would think that this is the same case that we should be filing against Obamacare. And I'm going to show you more as to how that is. Now, got to see the next one. This separation of the two spheres. What two spheres are we talking about? The federal sphere, which is smaller than the palm of your hand, and the state sphere, which is as big as this room, are one of the Constitution's structural protections of liberty. Well... <laughs> What? It's a stru what is? What's a structural protection of liberty? State sovereignty. That's not my opinion. This is the opinion of the court. And, and you know what I love about Scalia here? He's not interpreting the Constitution. He's enforcing it. He's quoting it. He's taking us through a history lesson. This is what every one of them should do. They're not to interpret. What did they promise to do when they took their oath? Uphold, defend, and obey. Protect and preserve the Constitution. If we had judges doing that and keeping their oaths, we wouldn't be in this mess. If we had cops doing the same thing, we wouldn't be in this mess. Just as the separation and independence of the coordinate branches of the federal government serve to prevent the accumulation of excessive power in any one branch, a healthy balance of power between the states and the federal government will reduce the risk of tyranny and abuse from either front. Let me ask you a question now. When you came to this meeting today, and we thank Todd and everybody else who made this happen, when you came to this meeting today, did you want to find a way to reduce the risk of tyranny? Well, you just saw it right here, and it comes from the United States Supreme Court by a couple of two small-town sheriffs. And you never really heard much about this case before, did you? Well, the Tea Party movement has resurrected it, and it's going like wildfire. And I can't even keep up with the requests. And I'm loving it because I'm being part of my country waking up. Man, I love that. And half the time, I don't even remember where I'm at. Where I'm at. And I go to Ohio on Wednesday for a three-presentation uh, three tour. And I've already done Ohio twice. And I did a six-day tour with them once with uh, Ron Paul started in o at Ohio State with Judge Napolitano. And there's another man. I, that's, that's who you want to run for president. Ron Paul and Vice President Judge Napolitano, right there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah, no kidding. And because of all this, yeah, a double security arises to the rights of the people. 
Don't you love that idea that you actually have a double security to your rights and freedom? The different governments will control each other at the same time that each will be controlled by itself. Another question. Anybody's mind at all wondering as to whether or not the federal government will control itself? <laughs> Every time I ask that, I get a laugh from the audience. And isn't that pathetic? No, they're not going to. So who's in charge of making sure they do? The states. It's our job. It's the reason we're here. State sovereignty and the Tenth Amendment are our only alternative left and I won't go to the other one there is another one but you will never and you never have and you never will hear me advocate violence I don't I won't I'm too peaceful of a person in 20 years of law enforcement I never beat up anybody I never shot anybody never maced anybody and I'm not gonna start now and uh, Time magazine lied about me October 10th of 2010 Light, uh, October 11th in their issue and they put me in an article the secret world of extreme militias and I'm in there and I've never been involved with a militia in my life except the same one that we're all part of and we're all part of the, the original militia and we're gonna just kinda look at this every peace officer in the world needs to know all that especially sheriffs the power of the federal government would be augmented immeasurably if it were able to impress into its service and at no cost to itself the police officers of the 50 states. That's what they did to me. That's what they did to the sheriffs. They tried to commandeer us for federal bidding and just say, hey, you are, we own you. And isn't it amazing that only seven sheriffs did anything about this? Seven. He sets the Commerce Clause straight. He sets the Supremacy Clause straight. The Supremacy Clause does not give carte blanche to the federal government. In fact, just the opposite. It's an, just another warning that they have to follow the Constitution. He, he, it says, the Supremacy Clause says, if you go by the Constitution, the laws you make are supreme. That's it. So Scalia says this law just brings us right back to whether or not it's a violation of the Constitution. But you can read that. It's in here. They're not, and we've sent it to about half of them. Now, I heard a state rep, a state rep in, or congressman in Virginia talk about our case, and then I haven't seen this, but we've been sending it to every one of them, including my own in Arizona. That includes uh, uh, Van Hollen here in Wisconsin. I, I don't know if they have it. You might want to check with them, get it to your, count, your uh, state attorney general. Yeah. But I know this will help. Now, look. If we were going to get, if we were going to sue the federal government on Obamacare, would you want it to say anything different than that? This is in the decision. It's here. You have it to take home. Okay? Look at that. The federal government we held may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program. And I was sitting next to a lawyer. Uh, she worked for the Army. And I had her read this on the plane. She asked what I do. <laughs> Mistake for her and I so I had to read it she read it and she goes like this the states don't have to do Obamacare that was the first thing out of her mouth she'd never heard of this case she went through law school she'd never heard of the case now if you ask most law school students they'll tell you they've heard of this case they have they've studied it and uh, I don't know what they study but uh, anyway what their impression is of the case but uh, anyway it's there Okay, Scalia now, and we're about, we only got about seven or eight minutes left. Scalia is so obsessed with wanting to call the other four judges that dissented in this decision. It was a 5-4 split. He wants to call them stupid really bad. But his, but his mom taught him not to do that. So he has to put it in legalese. And folks, this is in the decision. This is it. Empty formalistic reasoning of the highest order. That's how you call somebody stupid in the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay? And I'm not kidding you. This is in his decision. And now I'm going to show you why he wanted to call him stupid. Justice Stevens wrote the decision for the minority. There it is. 
if Congress believes that such a statute will benefit the people of the... See, all you have to do is believe that it's going to benefit. Okay? And serve the interest of cooperative federalism. In other words, cooperative federalism is commandeering and threatening to arrest. Okay? Better than an enlarged federal bureaucracy, because we all know how they hate that in Washington, D.C., right? We, the U.S. Supreme Court, we should respect both its policy judgment and its appraisal of its own constitutional power. I know, isn't that crazy? Now do you know why Scalia calls this empty formalistic reasoning of the highest order? Because it is. It's so stupid. And yet, if we'd have lost one more judge, this would have been the order of the court. And that just convinces me that we do not ask courts for permission to keep our oath of office. We should have just said no. But I wasn't ready to do that by myself. And nobody else wanted to go along, at least in Arizona that I saw. No other sheriffs came on board until about three or four weeks later. I thought I was going to be the Lone Ranger. And when, when uh, Prince filed, he never called me. We never talked about it. There's no cooperation. I learned about it on CBS Morning News as I was driving into the office. And I was thrilled. And then five others. And at least two of those did call us. But the first three or four, never, we never even met. The first time I met Prince was in New York City on the Phil Donahue show, talking about this case. Yeah. Now, this is my favorite quote from the entire decision. It's in that little booklet at least twice, and all my other books at least two or three times, because this is what we already all believe. But the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. Do you know what happens if... If just a third, maybe even 20% of all your state officials, especially your county officials, if they know and understand and implement that one line, do you realize how much government gets off your back? You're going to be free because the Constitution protects us from our own best intentions. It divides power among sovereigns and among branches of government precisely, so that we may resist the temptation to concentrate power in one location as an expedient solution <laughs> to the crisis of the day. End quote. Have you heard that crisis of the day thing? Never let a good crisis go to waste is the motto of our present administration. And even if you have to make up the crisis, they're going to, Offer us the solution. Now get this. Yeah, that's the one. Government derives its power from the consent of the people. Ever go. Ever Let me make this very plain to you, sir. We do not consent. And we will never consent. And what you've got to do is you, you've got to go back over there to your parliament and you've got to make it very plain to them. You've got to tell them that what we're fighting for is, a, is freedom from what we consider to be the rule of a foreign power. I mean, that's all we want. That's what this war is all about. Jim, no, 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 no. Now, now we, we established this country in the first place with very strong state governments just for that very reason. I mean, let me put it to you this way. My home is in Virginia. The government of my home is home. Virginia would not allow itself to be ruled by, by some uh, king over there in London, and it's not about to let itself be ruled by some president in Washington. Virginia, by God, sir, is going to be ruled by Virginia. Now, I certainly didn't come here to debate the Civil War with anybody. In fact, I disagree with a lot of people that say uh, the Civil War got rid of state sovereignty. Why would the northern states give up state sovereignty because of the Civil War? No way. It didn't change that at all. I still believe more than anything that it got rid of slavery. And I'm glad that that part happened. But I am not glad that we fought a war forcing people to stay in the Union. We're going to kill you if you try to leave the Union. That's absurd. But Rosa Parks, nevertheless, I think taught us all a lesson that the principles of freedom are something that we should stand and risk ourselves for. That's what we need to do. 
And that's, that, that to me it helps us. It helps everything we stand for today. The other side believes in her and what she did. And so do I. And some people have come up to me and said, no, 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 that wasn't right. And uh, um, it was all staged. I don't care. It's a history lesson for us that we don't get to the back of the bus and we stand for our freedom and we stand for our rights. And I believe that General James Kimber, who was killed in this battle, this is the movie Gettysburg, called it right. That we're not to be run by Washington, D.C. That we run our own affairs. And then, yes, we make sure that each of us is standing with constitutional guards throughout our county and throughout our country. And there's 3,100 of these constitutional guards known as sheriffs that will put themselves in the way to make sure that our freedom and our constitution are still the foundation of America. We're losing too much. We can't wait for this anymore. We have to get on board now. I'm moving to Texas in 10 days because a group of patriots there want me to take this sheriff thing to the next level. And we're going to get a we and I'm going to have an office and we're going to have a, a, a new website and it's the CSPOA, the Constitutional Sheriff Peace Officer Association. You can see that on my website. And we're going to have a national sheriff convention and we're raising the money to do this right now to get 150 sheriffs together to know and understand what their oath of office is. And we're going to establish a national agenda for constitutional sheriffs. And you're going to be able to look on our website and look up any sheriff, yours or your cousin's or someplace you might move. And we're going to rank every sheriff in the country. Yeah. You think that'll put a little pressure on them? And that's what we're doing. And so we're moving from Arizona to Texas to do this. Fredericksburg, Texas. And uh, we feel really good about it. We're, all they wanted me to do is take what I'm doing now to the next level. And I'm more than happy to do that. We're going to do what I'm doing now bigger, faster, and better. We're working on a new deal. I've, I've about three-fourths of a way on a new book. They're trying to get me a national publicist. And the title of the book is The Magic of Gun Control. And the subtitle is There Isn't Any. And it explains all this in, in real contemporary and historical terms. But I want you to know there's one other thing you need to see here. And it's the final order of the court in this case. This is what Scalia, you can see Scalia shaking his finger at the United States Congress. And here it is. Start in yellow. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. Where do you think Obamacare is going to be enforced? It's going to be right here, every county, every state. It matters not whether policy making is involved and no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. Now folks, I got to tell you one other thing here about Judge Roll. This thing about no case by case weighing of the burdens or benefits came from our case. The sheriffs in this case only testified at the district court. The rest of them, at the circuits and at the Supreme Court, it's just a review, and the lawyers get a chance to make a last oral argument. At the Supreme Court, you get a half hour each. And I don't mean 30 minutes and 30 seconds. 30 minutes, and you're done. Well, in, when I was testifying in Judge Roll's courtroom, the attorney for the federal government was cross-examining me and she broke protocol and all of a sudden she starts testifying to the judge. She's given testimony. And she goes, she, here I am, and she turns to the judge, she goes, why, your honor, in the first four months of the implementation of the Brady Bill background checks, we've already denied 250,000 felons access to handguns in this country. And I'm sitting there going, 
why isn't my attorney objecting to this? She's giving testimony. And luckily, he let her go because the judge took care of it himself. And he said, Counselor, do not try to pretend in this courtroom that your statistical analysis somehow equates to constitutionality. Did I tell you? Did I tell you what an amazing man this was? And I was actually speaking in Beaumont, California, Saturday morning, when someone in the audience told me, when I showed the quote from Roll, from Judge Roll, they said, did you know he was killed this morning? And I'm telling you, I was fighting back tears. I had to take a little pause because this man had such a huge impact on my life and on this case. And to find out that he actually went down the way he did trying to save someone else. He actually blocked a bullet for somebody else. And I tell you, he sure blocked some bullets for me. And this was a great, great man. Now, I close every one of my speaking engagements the same. I don't care where I am or who I'm with. I don't care if it's politicians or liberals or, or Democrats, Republicans. I don't care. I really don't care about the party stuff anyway. I care about the Constitution and I care about America. If you're with me on that, I don't care what party you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what religion you are. All I care is if you're American, then we're going to stand hand in hand and we're going to do whatever we can to save our country. And that's all it is to me. And that's what I'm doing here today and that's why I'm here. And I do this full time. That's all I do. And, I, and I'll, oh, if, if we want to put in the hours, I work. Anyway. I want you to come on board with this as best you can. And now you have to take this. I can't be out here in Wisconsin all the time. I already came here once, and you can see the picture on the front page of my website where I'm drinking raw milk on the state capitol steps in Wisconsin. Boy, you guys have a weird state capitol, let me tell you. you know? <laughs> but anyway, I'm in Madison. And I told these guys, <laughs> an Amish farmer. I didn't know him before. He's not a relative of mine. He wasn't a friend of mine, but he is now. He's my brother. Vernon Hirschberger and Max Kane, both raided because they don't burn and destroy their milk products and dairy products. And they're standing firm in their beliefs of freedom. And they asked me to come out and speak. And then they said, will you go drink milk with us at the state capitol? and challenge the police to come arrest us. And I said, that sounds great. You better make sure that milk is cold, though. I don't want any warm milk. And I drank milk with them, and you can see the picture. And my kids were amazed by it because that was the first time in their lives they ever saw me drink milk because I hate milk. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, to me, that was the best tasting milk in the world because it was freedom milk. And... That's what we need to do. We need to stand together. And even though you might not be dairy farmers, we stand for this guy anyway because it's a matter of freedom. And we try to protect freedom at all costs. Now, remember that training I went to? The police training I went to, to Dr. Skousen's class when I was converted to the Constitution? Well, while we were there, he handed all 240 cops a copy of his book, The Making of America. That's really what the class was. We didn't talk about the Miranda decision or how to shoot a gun better or officer tactics or anything else like this. We studied the making of America. And that's why I was converted. And at one point when he handed me the book, he signed it for me and he said, promise me, he looked me right in the eye, he said, promise me that you'll teach these things to your children. Well, I kept that promise. And now I teach them all across the country. And I've even started teaching them to my grandkids. And the oldest one isn't even five years old yet. But let me tell you something about her. She was born on the 4th of July. And her name's Liberty. And she's taught me a lot. She's convinced me that we all need our little Liberty. And so I'll close with what Dr. Skousen taught all 240 of us big tough cops. He has us all stand up and he teaches us a little kindergarten exercise. And I've nicknamed it America's Political Prayer. 
And it's probably not a prayer at all, but maybe, again, it's the only one we got left. And I dedicate it to each of you. I dedicate it to your children and your grandchildren. I dedicate it to Judge Roll and to Dr. Skousen, God rest their souls. And mostly, I want you to know that this is from my heart to yours, that we can take our country back. And remember, while I'm doing this, I learned this at police training. If I could get you to hold the mic. Right there. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America and that's the eagle long may she be free